Welcome to Gerard Alliance Church Online. I'm so glad that you decided to watch this video, and I'm excited uh, at what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the book of Galatians and see what Paul has to say about the difference between law versus grace. Would you take a moment, though, before we begin uh, to pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for breath in our lungs, for life, um, for the things that we easily take for granted. Lord, we are grateful for. And God, I pray that you will speak life into each one of us. In these next few moments, Lord, I pray that the distractions will cease um, and that we will just be able to concentrate and focus on what you want to do through this message today. God, I pray that my words will not be a demonstration of man's wisdom, but um, it will be a demonstration of the Spirit's power in and through me, Father. God, I just pray that you will be glorified and high and lifted up through this, Lord. We love you and thank you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, so there's always been a circumstance that has fascinated me for quite some time. It's this strange yet uncontrollable dilemma of what we call catch 22. I've got to say, I love these three definitions of this phrase given by Merriam Webster. One, a catch 22 is an illogical, unreasonable, or senseless situation. Two, it's a measure or policy whose effect is the opposite of what was intended. And three, it's a situation presenting two equally, listen to this, equally undesirable alternatives. I mean, none of these options seem very beneficial. In fact, any catch-22 situation usually is presented in a way that there's a benefit, but more times than not, it's too good to be true. Or in the long run, it may not end up being worth much at all. When it comes down to it, many times when we are met with a catch-22, we're left with no other option. We're left with no other option. This past week, my family and I, we walked into a new ice cream shop. On any given day, they have 52 flavors to choose from. They have 52 options. That's a lot of options, especially if you have a family like mine that likes to taste test a lot, right? Have you ever been to a Build-A-Bear workshop? Options. Sportsman's Warehouse, rows and rows of options. Have you uh, recently repainted your house or re-carpeted your floor? Options, options, and even more options. When I worked at Babies R Us, uh, people would get overwhelmed with filling out the registry list because there were so many options. Between 20 different kinds of strollers and car seats to, to 12 different pack and plays. And don't even get me started with furniture and mattresses and bedding. But for some reason or another, more times than not, people like options. The more options, the merrier. They thrive off of them. It's only when we are limited that it gets difficult. What's it like for you? What do you do? How do you respond when you're limited? When there seems to be no other option? What about when we have no other option in our life other than to trust God. We're all too familiar with the most infamous judge in the history of Israel, that strong man named Samson. As you know, he was tricked uh, by Delilah and sold to the Philistines as a slave, and his powers were sapped 
because his strength, of course, was sapped because of his disobedience. And yet we find an interesting ending to his life. Judges 16, 27 through 30 says this. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. O God, please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistine for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them as his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus, he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Samson here was definitely left limited, right? But even within his limitation, God answered his request. And what's fascinating to me is that phrase that we find here at the end. Thus, Samson killed many more when he died than while he lived. Basically, Samson was saying, make them pay, God. Let me get revenge on them. There's just no other way. Then we look at another strong man. But his strength is different than Samson's. By his limitation, he was actually fulfilling the promise that God gave to humanity. Philippians 2 says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's what Jesus did for you and me. What's more, Luke writes in his gospel about the scene surrounding Jesus' death. And in Luke 23, 34, and 43, you can read further through this. But it gives uh, an encounter, a description of Jesus on the cross. And he, he first he speaks to the women that are there at the cross. And then he turns to the soldiers and men who are crucifying him. And he prays this prayer. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Then, not too soon after that, he promises the one criminal who asks for a personal favor. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus tells him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, the thief on the cross is the personification of belief through faith. I've heard this thief who was promised paradise the same day from Jesus. He's called an 11th hour believer. I've heard of people being saved on their deathbeds. Listen, if there's anything that refutes faith by works or faith by human merit, it's these two examples. Listen, we cannot do anything to earn God's favor, period. Jesus gives this no other option criteria in John 14, 6, when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Guess what? Salvation Eternal life, there is no other option, no other way or ways. It's only through Jesus Christ. You know, one of the most raw and blatant letters Paul wrote to the churches was 
his letter to the church in Galatia. He writes in Galatians 1, 6, and 7, I am astonished, astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, he continues, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. I mean, think about this. Paul isn't bashful whatsoever. He tells them from the get-go, hey, listen, you're making a decision here. You, you're choosing to desert the gospel of Christ. And for what? This situation comes to a head in the text that we'll be looking at today. But right before our passage, Paul says this, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? Or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to, listen to this, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Ah, there it is. There it is. Paul is getting to the root of the problem. He's asking, basically, is your faith based upon what you can do or what God has already done? Is your faith based upon what you can do, what you can muster up, what you can give? Or is it about what God has already done? Is it based upon the law of man or the grace of God? And today I I want us to look a little deeper into that thought. Now, as Paul writes this portion of the letter, I love the statements that he gives and, and the fact that he backs them up by Old Testament passages. He he gives reliable proof to the importance of understanding that salvation comes to us through faith in Jesus Christ. Not out of what we've done or what we can do or could do or will do. Nope. It's all by the grace of God. The Apostle Peter concludes his first letter by writing, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakest weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And then he says this, that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to Galatians 3, 10 through 14. Galatians 3, 10 through 14. First, we're going to look at verses 10 through 12 and look at the burden of proof. Burden of proof. Galatians 3, 10 through 14. We're going to focus on verses 10 through 12. The Bible says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. 
Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. There are two words that can stop a debate dead in its tracks. I've recently been watching a lot of, of, of videos of debates between conservatives and liberals, creationists versus evolutionists, pro-life versus pro-choice, basically one side against the other. And these debates are done in a variety of ways across multiple platforms and entities. And, and the topics of debate are really what's important, but most of the time the lines are blurred and the debates are over, overtaken by anger and annoyance and, and everything in between. You know, we could debate and argue until we're blue in the face, but whichever side that we're on, the same crisis occurs. Will the arguments and debates truly persuade the other person to change their minds or their heart on what's being said? And undoubtedly, the argument is disrupted when, here it comes, these two words happen. These two words are said. When someone says, prove it. Prove it. Sometimes, they'll just incessantly say it over and over again. Prove it. No, 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 no. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. In a court of law, the burden of proof is a party's responsibility to prove a, a disputed charge or allegation or defense. Now, what I find really interesting is that there are two parts to this burden of proof. First, it's the burden of production. Burden of production. And this is the component that they are oblig obligated to provide evidence to the jury or the judge. And, and once they've done that, once they've, they've shown the burden of, of production, they now have the burden of persuasion that's set in motion. The burden of persuasion is a responsibility to convince the judge or jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Paul... <laughs> so far has given solid proof through his letter to the Galatians that trusting in man's effort is detrimental to building their faith and belief in God. If, if we were, think about this, if we were appeased by our works, then we would have no interest whatsoever in God. No interest. If that was all we needed, if works, like some of the other religions and faiths believe, if works were good enough, then what good is God? So just briefly, I want us to look at the burden of proof. Paul gives the importance of understanding God's grace over the law. He makes three statements of proof. First, he says, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. He backs it up by referring to Deuteronomy 27, 26. It says this, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. This past week, my kids and I, we played this quest game. And as you go through all the different uh, quests and adventures and, and levels, they get harder and harder. And on the second to last adventure, for me it was the hardest. It took me 13 tries to defeat the red dragon. And here was the problem. You had to shoot the dragon with these, these ice arrows three times. Three times it took to defeat the dragon. If you missed once, if you missed once, you were done. You were cooked. You would be defeated. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You were toast. One! One miss! Can you believe that? It had to be flawless. It had to be perfect, spot on to defeat the dragon. Notice 
what Deuteronomy 27, 26 says. How much of the law do you have to continue in? Just continue in the parts that, that we've got down pat? Just continue in the laws that we like or can easily be done? No, there's no other option here. It's everything or nothing. You're cursed, he says in Deuteronomy, if you do not do everything, every single last law written in the book of the law. Everything? Everything. Second, Paul says, Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law. This idea of justification, again, this is a legal term. Simply put, it means to be in right standing. You could stretch it to mean on good terms. My favorite quote for remembering the process of justification is what my college professor used to say. Just if I cation. Just as if I had never sinned. But Paul doesn't shy away from expressing the impossibility of this. He says, no one is justified before God by the law. Listen, what he's saying here is it doesn't matter how much you have, who you know, what you know, none of it matters. None of it matters when it comes to justification. To go along with that, Paul writes in Romans 3, 19 through 22, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous or justified in his sight, in God's sight, by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now, righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Ready for this? Here we go. Right here. Gives you the answer. This righteousness from God comes through faith. Not works. Faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Third, Paul writes, the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, and here it is, here's the difference. You ready for it? The man who does these things will live by them. Paul seems to paraphrase this a little bit. He's referring to Leviticus 18.5, which says, keep my decrees and laws, there you go, for the man who obeys them will live by them. You see, the burden of proof in this statement has more to do with the likelihood of a person continuing to obey the laws and decrees. That's the stipulation. That they'll continue with obedience to the laws and decrees. Do my laws. While at the same time partaking in the abundance of God's blessing because of it. Because if they do these laws, then he will enjoy life. Now think about it. This is, this is problematic for two reasons. Two reasons. First, there is this striving after. When it comes to the law, there's this, this striving after to keep something that's impossible to keep it if it were left up to human reason, ability, and willpower. It would be impossible, basically, to do what they're saying. But, secondly, if, if that could be done, if everybody could keep all of the law, the pursuit of this blessed life, or, or the pursuit of happiness, if you will, would negate the desire for God. You'd be going after the gift and the blessings rather than the giver or the one who blesses. The psalmist writes in Psalm 37, 4, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
That right there, from the very beginning, we're told to delight ourselves in the Lord. Not delight in things that He can give us or, or the things that He's promised us, but Him, in Him alone. So this is the burden of proof that Paul lays upon the Galatians and, and any believer for that matter. If it were up to us, listen, here's the deal. If it were up to us, we'd fall short. We'd fall short. So then, if that was the end of the story, right, we'd be lost and hopeless. Like when Ham hits a home run and the Sandlot boys can't play anymore. But thankfully, it's not the end of the story. We've looked at the burden of proof, and now it's time to look at the power. The power. Look at verses 13 and 14 with me. Verses 13 and 14, the power. Whew, this is good. You ready? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith, there it is, by faith we might receive the power of the Spirit. Yes! Yes, that's what I'm talking about. How incredible is this truth? Christ redeemed us. He redeemed us. He, he brought freedom. He bought us back. Hallelujah. Now that's something to celebrate. Listen. The power of Christ's death and resurrection freed us from the curse of the law. It freed us from the curse of the law. What was the curse? That we were left powerless. That it was out of our control. The more that we would try to control our own destiny, the harder it would be to grasp. It's like what Jim Elliot wrote in his diary before his martyrdom. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Not only that, think about this. Jesus became a curse for us. Wow. The prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah 53, 7 through 10, he was oppressed and afflicted, he's talking about Jesus, Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? Don't miss this now. Don't miss what it says. For he was cut off. From the land of the living, he was made a curse. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And then listen to this. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. And cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, I love this part, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Do you know what this tells me? Do you know what this says to me? Jesus, who is powerful, I mean, way beyond powerful, gave up his power voluntarily to save the powerless. Romans 5, 6 says, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Notice how Paul finishes this entire passage. He lays it all out there about uh, who the promise is intended for. It, it's not just the Jews. It's not for the Jews only. It goes beyond that. This power in the promise extends even to the Gentiles. But again, I want you to clearly see this. It's, it's not contingent upon man's works or obedience. Instead, Paul writes, so that by faith, by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And the same promise is the one that the author of Hebrews writes about in Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39, and 40. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been, there it is, promised. But here's what's even cooler. It says this, God has planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Listen, there's no other option. There was no other option. Sometimes in life, no matter how hard we try, it's just no use. But isn't it great to know? Isn't it a huge relief to know that our eternity is not based on a burden of proof? Rather, it's based upon the power through Christ's death and resurrection. Praise the Lord. Eternity does not depend on us. It doesn't depend on us. Yes, we need to rely on the promises and power of God. Yes, for the time being, God calls each of us to a deeper desire for more of Him. Yes, He calls us to a life of surrender and obedience. But listen, we're promised in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. He says this, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say this with confidence. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? May God provide confidence and boldness to live for him. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this message. This reminder that it's not about us. It's all about you. God, I pray that you will speak life into us. Use us. Pour us out and fill us up with more of you, God. We love you and we thank you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in that grace.